a way of selling some toys to a bunch of kids. And they go ahead and do that. And they ended up working with a guy named Lou Scheimer. And Lou Scheimer said, hey, guess what? I'm actually going to build some meat into this. I'm going to put some moral fiber in that. I'm going to make it something that is more than just a crass commercial exercise. Same thing that happened with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, you have some people who go in with their goals, but you have writers and you have artists and you have voice actors and you have a giant group of creators who come in and it's not just going to be an action figure or a series of action figures. It's going to end up being something that has some heart and has some reality to it. And I think Rob would jump in with some really strong opinions in that. Yeah, I, I think what makes He-Man really great and everything masters the universe is that it came out everything opposite instead of having an idea for a show that should appeal to this demographic and these kids and it should sell like hotcakes on shelves in the form of action figures it was everything vice versa it's like here's the action figure what's the show and then here's the show and it's not just going to be saturday morning it's going to be all the time monday through friday so they started with the end goal and they were able to basically approach everything else from a, a much more interesting point of view because they had that deal done and because they had the deal done, they could just focus on the creative. And I think that's why Masters of the Universe, He-Man, She-Ra, uh, Skeletor, that's why this entire these this whole roster of characters continues to resonate nowadays because it wasn't about really pushing the merchandise a, as an end goal because that was kind of already taken care of. It was about the characters that they could create, the stories that they could tell kids, and uh, and how those creators could express themselves in that medium. And I think if you were to do some... If, you, if, if Erica Scheimer were here right now talking about her dad, she would say stuff that would make you think, oh, this guy wasn't kidding around. He approached this very seriously. And he had rules. Eh, rules is not the right way to say it. He had a moral code that he thought was really important. And he thought making entertainment for kids was um, more than just selling them something. There was a responsibility that he took very seriously. I, I had a great chat with her on the phone, and she made that very clear. And you have to remember, there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people who jump into a franchise like this, and they have that moral imperative. And I don't want to make it sound bigger than it is, but they want to make something that's meaningful. They they take their responsibility seriously more than just Lou Scheimer or Erica Scheimer. I'd say you have a bunch of people who, to this day, and and Rob, think about those artists we know who take it so seriously. I was at WonderCon last week, and I saw the, are they the PCS, um, the new action figures, the she action figure, for example. Yeah, the pop culture statues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the PCS ones. And, and really good. And you can just see it when you look at it. This isn't something where somebody's just carving out, you know, an action figure and going on to the next one. I'd say these people are putting a lot of care and attention to detail into it. So... In spite of the best efforts of maybe Mattel at the time to just let's just sell some action figures, they got more than they bargained for. I mean, it's still a DC comic to this day. Sure. Yeah. It. Uh, I mean, honestly, when I when I run into somebody in a more often, I run into people like women in She-Ra costumes than I run into anyone dressed as He-Man. Uh, just because oh, yeah. of the look of He-Man is a little harder to pull off for a guy who needs to look like. And let's Dolph be fair, though, the other side of that is there aren't exactly a ton of iconic female characters that a lot of people can get behind and instantly, you know, feel like they can celebrate in the way that you can do that with someone like She-Ra. And the, uh, the, so when I run into them, I ask them, oh, are you reading the DC comic? They're like, no. And I'm like, oh, my God. Mm. It is seriously a well-written He-Man comic book. Yeah. Uh, the stuff around. with Again. She-Ra was so good leading up to her creation before they started the the War of Grayskull, uh, story, uh, the War of Eternia story yeah. arc. Yeah, it's a, it's all solid stuff. And, you know, everybody nowadays that grew up with it, some people want that mature approach that DC is giving them in, in the current books. Some people just want the nostalgia, and that's great because those cartoons are still there. And some people want the middle ground, which is why they get... You know, those pop culture statues and some of the, the Masters of the Universe classics figures, which have continued the story in the vein of the old stuff with the bios and some of the new books that Dark Horse is, is publishing. So for guys like Randall and myself, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun doing Kickstarter. We, we raised, you know, like $76,000. We got the support of the community. It's, it's the blessing and the curse. It's like, okay, you guys wanted us to make this. Now the burden, the, the good burden is on us 
to kind of bring it all together and explore it all in, in ways that some fans are expecting in ways that they're not going to expect. And we're going to expose everybody to different assets and in different corners of this realm that is Masters of the Universe. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I have to give a shout out to the person who um, had posted about the documentary while the Kickstarter was going on, um, and which got me hooked to contribute to it. Uh, Danielle, aka Penny Dreadful from Shilling sure. Shockers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, longtime friend of the show. She's been on a couple times. Uh, it was a. It was a. It, it was always great running into her and her uh, late husband at conventions. And uh, she'll be at uh, Super Mega Fest next weekend. Uh, but uh, she was a He-Man fan, which was kind of cool. And uh, she always kept posting about He-Man stuff. So it was your documentary and the Dark Horse book that came out last year, which was awesome. Uh, yeah. All the mini comics being republished. Yep, those. Uh, it's really cool to have them all in in kind of one one spot, and I, I think it's really encouraging a lot of collectors now that they do have the the all in one pack for archival purposes to go out and try to collect the issues that they didn't have or didn't know about, including the Shira mini comics, which are in there as well. Yeah, definitely. Which is which is uh, really cool because I I never read those. I mean, I I was growing up. I was growing up. I watched Shira, but I never bought the toys. Uh, I always found it funny though that they that the 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 evil horde appeared on her show, but her toy line the only character she had in her toy line of evil horde characters was uh, uh well, Pan- you know why Catra. though right Catra. Catra. Yeah. yeah you know why that that is right because Shira was coming along to begin with and the girls division was going to design her and get that out there and then Masters of the Universe decided to take her over those guys and the horde had already been in development which is why that through line is so obvious and why they stuck with them on the toy side and then the girls wanted to get her back the girls toy so they they let her go back after the input from from the boys toys so there was a little bit of internal conflicts from from the early research that i've done on that but it was enough to mesh the brands and the in the worlds together that it kind of got the best of both sides of it and i think there's evidence of that even in the in the cartoon which is I think a little bit of a notch above some of the stuff that we got in the He-Man cartoon. Wow. That right there, statement made. Going it's funny how <laughs> some, people will, some people will say to us, uh, you know, you're doing a He-Man documentary, are you going to talk about She-Ra? But I think Rob and I, both for different reasons, really come into this looking at She-Ra as a really interesting and even even yourself, Chris, it sounds like you think so, or Doctor Chris, I guess you think that she runs a more not more interesting, but a very interesting character. And it's it's funny to hear some people sort of assume that we're not going to pay her a certain amount of credit or not going to take a look at her story, but that there it are, comes it comes up again and again how key it is. There are aspects of Shira I think are quite interesting. I'll admit that uh, as an adult rewatching her cartoon, I'm like. Oh my God, this is awful! But uh, reading what DC did with her, I was like, "This is this is amazing." And there were uh, um, there were sketches that came out uh, when the He Man cartoon in the two thousands got canceled, which was I was so disappointed that that got canceled because I thought that was one of the best animated and uh, written cartoons a, ever. It's an Emmy Award winner. Did you know that? Yeah, Episode I did. Thirty two or thirty three. Uh, the problem with power won an Emmy, I believe. And, and, and I loved how they went into the background of, like, Grayskull and the fact Grayskull was this king. We got origin and, stories for once. Yeah, yeah, you know? And it was so well animated. And, and He-Man's transformation was a lot better. He, was, he turned into another person, whereas it was just, like, Prince Adam with a tan and a deeper voice. Um, it, it, so many things, just so much better. And then, of course, all these sketches came out afterwards after the show was canceled saying, oh, by the way, so in third season, she was going to show up. And they showed us what the new she was going to look like. And she looked like a bad ass i mean she looked like wonder woman you know she was tall and muscular she wasn't just this you know kind of supermodel looking character that they had in the original cartoon so i was just like wow i'm they actually were... looking at a comic-con exclusive toy right now that was made based on those designs for the 2000x series which is pretty really? cool so i know exactly what you're talking about man uh, on radio on radio you're looking at <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody can see my gaze off camera to the 2000X Shira incarnate. This is like uh, when we have it's cool. This is like when we have models in the studio or something. And I'm just like, look at you, and you're so hot. <laughs> well, that's like Robin. That's pretty much us, right? That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> you know, something you said, Chris, that, that 
I'd like to drop in on is you mentioned that you went back to look at the She-Ra, She-Ra cartoon or animation, however you want to phrase it, and and you weren't too impressed. And I would say that's fine. That's It was what it was. It doesn't take away from what it was and how it was important to people at the time. I mean, again, I won't speak for Rob and, and our one of our co-filmmakers, Isaac Elliott Fisher, but they were the right age to watch those the first time and really sit and absorb that I would say the the stories and the characters and absorb it in a way that if they went back now and watched it, it would be totally different. But that's the beauty of nostalgia, right? You don't have to get informationally or, you know, animation wise, any of that isn't as important as that nostalgia and that feeling of, you know, where was I when I watched this and what did it mean to me then? Would you say, Rob? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I've obviously gone back and looked at, you know, some of the original Filmation stuff and, of course, the New Adventures and the 2000X stuff that you're talking about, Chris, from Mike Young Productions. Yeah. And, you know, nostalgia is the reason that I go back and it's the reason that, you know, Randall and I and Isaac and Mark, uh, the other collaborators, started, you know, talking about making this project. So nostalgia is the motivation for me to go back and look at this. But there's a whole nother level of appreciation where I'm viewing these, you know, Aesop fables, if you will. Uh, skinned in Masters of the Universe in a whole different light that I can appreciate. So whatever it was that clicked in me as a child that you know had its hooks in me, I'm, I'm I I love it. I don't know what that is. I don't know how to define what that initial draw was, but that's the reason I'm going back to rediscover it now as as a more or less fully formed adult let's, with, let's with say. fractures. Let's say <laughs> we'll say man child maybe. Man child uh, <laughs> say that. who we spends that. his allowance well on action figures and toys and, and it's yes. way more powerful when you have to make that allowance by working though. Yes. Would you say? Yeah, I, I had to vacuum the, the floors to get my allowance. I always have an excuse saying, oh, I had a son so I could continue playing with my toys or whatever, but I have an excuse so I can like, bring my Transformers over with my kid and be like, look, I got the new foot-and-a-half-tall Devastator that transforms into nice. five huge robots. Let's play with it. He's like, yeah. See, my, my <laughs> excuse is, is, are these documentaries, and I call buying the toys research. <laughs> So yeah, when you're so, when you're caught in your office playing with them and so on and so forth, you're uh... yeah. My wife will just peer around the corner and say, "What are you doing?" Oh, I'm just testing uh, points of articulation and, and narrative uh, visibility. Uh, like in Spaceballs, That's... where uh, Dark Helmet's playing with the action yes. figures. <laughs> Very much. That's a pretty good callback right there. Yeah, That's definitely pretty much the case every Monday through Friday morning. Now, you guys, I noticed, touch upon like almost every aspect of He-Man, uh, and I want to go back to Lou uh, really quickly. Um, you know, because he he's so important to to uh, mm-hmm. the creation of He Man or for what it is. Uh, when he died, I felt as though that it was like, uh, and I'm not talking like I'm not talking about major news sources because they're not going to care. Uh, if it was like if it was Stanley, that'd be a bit different. But on geeky forms, in geeky boards and stuff like that, I feel like his death was like. Whew, and then that was it. I was like, oh, my God, i got to post something about this guy. This guy created my childhood. And, you know, I found out some interesting facts. Like, he was one of the first people in an animated show put his name in the credits in the beginning of the show because he's like, I'm creating this. I want my name in the beginning of the credits. And, you know, he has the right to do so. And, again, you know, uh, everything else he created besides He-Man or helped produce besides He-Man, it just it, it seems like he kind of got forgotten about. Well, I, I would say some people forgot about him, but correct me if I'm wrong, was he one of the last, if not the last, American animators in terms of as a company that was based in America making animation for kids, not farming it out to somebody else? He was one of the last animators who had his feet kind of in the old world. I don't want to say like a Disney-type world, but you know, this is a guy who was at a key time in history. You know, he was a German Jew in World War II. How about that? And then growing up in America at a time where animation sort of explodes and blossoms, and he jumps into it and starts building his version of it, and he's tied to, I mean, he's tied to some some Tarzan, there's some Batman there, there's some big, and, and, and of course, He-Man comes from Conan to some degree, so... There's some big stuff that he did. He did some stuff with Ralph Bakshi for adults. This was a guy who, if you look at some of the bigger animation themes or companies or ideas of his time period, he's right in there. 
I think it's interesting, and if you know you're gonna make a case study for Lou Scheimer, it's his ability, and it bakes right into the history that you mentioned, Rand, as a, a German slash Jew, this dual identity, yeah. forced to go somewhere else to succeed. He kept oh, everything yeah. at home, and all his animation cartoons, for the most part, are heavy transformational, both in tone of theme and of the main character, even like his version of Ghostbusters. Of course, all the Hanna-Barbera DC characters, Star Trek, uh, you know, Thunder the Barbarian, of course, He-Man, She-Ra, uh, even Fat Albert, you know, all that stuff is hugely transformational. And I think it goes back to him. And you could say, you know, for the guy who voices King Randor, is there a better kind of, you know, metaphor for how, you know, a filmation was set up and then later Lou Scheimer animation? Uh, he's a bit of a king, but I think by design, he stays in the background. You know, as much as his name is out there, people will say, oh, yeah, I know that name. And, oh, I know the filmation sound at the beginning of the cartoons and I yeah. know and I know the look it's funny that really became an uh uh I don't know almost like a little it's a motif part. right yeah, yeah it's, it's a little, little ding. I yeah, love that I'm gonna really play that I'll, I'm gonna play that before I start this documentary tonight uh this interview cool. tonight you should know uh Chris that I'm older than you probably and certainly older than Rob and Isaac and my approach to He-Man was not from a watcher of it in first run. I come in at it from a more scholarly level. So it's it's these very elements that appeal. I shouldn't say scholarly. From a, a outside of of the franchise and looking at it from the outside and kind of weighing it and assessing it. And in a way, the elements that we're talking about right now are some of the most interesting and some of the best parts, irrespective of the animation. And you do look at the nostalgia and think it's important. And nostalgia, remember, is a feeling. So this idea that Lou Scheimer brought a lot of the feeling into this that, that lasts to this day, it, it really is, it's no surprise that when he passed away a few years back that it was meaningful to a lot of people because that's the soundtrack to a lot of people's lives, a lot of kids' lives. And his daughter, Erica, really, really uh, treasures her dad and she has uh, quite kindly, I mean, I, I'm assuming this is still the case, quite kindly agreed to let us have access to a lot of his archives. So we're really excited to dig into that. What the, <clears throat> excuse me, I grew up on He-Man uh, at the right time period. I was born in uh, the, the very beginning of that entire decade. I was born January 4th, 1980. Um and uh, He-Man was coming out, I think, what, 81, 82? But it was like around 84, 85, 86 is when all that stuff, G.I. Joe, Transformers, He-Man was like exploding hmm. for children. And so I was right in the cusp of it. And like my and one of my earliest memories of He-Man, uh, besides watching the cartoon, was uh, I think it was 1987, Christmas morning, I finally got uh, Castle Grayskull. <laughs> and what did that feel like? Why does that memory stand out to you? Oh, it was like the coolest toy of all time. I mean, it was such an awesome playset, and just all. And I had a ton of the toys. I still wish I had them today. I wish I'd never listened to my father and got rid of them. <laughs> but you uh, must have seen our photo, uh, the photo on our our Facebook page of Dolph Lundgren now with he, the uh, Castle Grayskull. Now, Rob, you found that, didn't you? Yeah, that was part of a Bleeding Cool article that posted uh, the story, which is essentially Dolph and a man cave next to his director. The name is escaping me. They're shooting a horror film, but you know the director was able to snap that kind of cool shot, and it went over really well on our page. I can tell you that. That's the thing; it's still resonant. So that gray skull toy. I mean, Chris, you're not the only one who has fond memories of that. You guys, you guys had mentioned uh, Ralph Bakshi uh, that uh, Lou had worked with him. We had uh, Ralph on the show last year, or sorry, two years oh, ago. Wow. Talk that, about a legend. Yeah, it was an uh, epic moment to have him on the show with us. Um, he, uh, We didn't talk about Lou. Uh, we, we mostly stuck to a lot of the, the stuff that Ralph was known for and some things that I wasn't aware of. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think the tie between Lou and Ralph is that they were of a time period. And I shouldn't say that they worked together because I, I don't know that they – ever crossed paths specifically, but they were at a, at a similar time period, they were working in the same field. I mean, Lou did some stuff in, I don't remember the year, but it was in the 90s maybe, where he started to do a little bit more adult work. And to me, he's in the same space in my head. And it could be that I'm 
going off on a wild, you know, path here that's not true. So I, I don't want people to think that I have, you know, footage of them sitting at a picnic table animating plasticine dinosaurs or something. <laughs> I don't think we, we don't have that. But we, we, we may indeed find that there is a link there. The uh, so you guys touch upon everything in He Man in this documentary, like everything to do with the the franchise. We're it's certainly con- gonna seek it out. <laughs> it's yeah, it's conceivable that we will miss the one thing that somebody loves most. That voice actor who did that thing. There are some people who they don't want to contribute to a documentary. They're tired. They're you know you you could find a myriad of reasons why we can't get something that somebody thinks is the best part. But if there's a He-Man phase, moment, element, thread, theme, we'll try to get it. And, you know, those uh, those phone lines are still open, callers. If you want (laughs) to drop a message and let us know what you would like to see in in Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters Universe, just call us up on Facebook or Twitter. We'd like to know. I mean, it's still not too late for that. I just uh... John Irwin's son, and you can convince him to talk to us, don't stop. I, I Get just, them on the phone. I just emailed you guys a link to... Uh, I'm trying to find the date I posted this. But it was uh, it was when uh, Lou passed away. I, I made a post about it on my uh, my my website. Back well, in 2013. 2013 when he passed away. Nice. Yeah, you, you got the, the image there from that one history book that was out. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a great, it's a great image, too. I, I, I still got to read that. I've never read that thing. Yeah, it looks pretty all-encompassing and, and quite quite not enough for the for the impact of such a creator. I, re- hey, I remember he, also seeing this picture. Voice. Huh? Did he do the voice of Orko? Yeah. He did? Yep. Is there anything that we can prove that links Orko and Batmite? <laughs> I'm sure it's there. Uh, I, 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 it right now, live. It's a live Google. I do love what DC Comics did with Orko <laughs> in there. Their yeah, little universe, that, that, especially that crossover. <laughs> oh, with with the uh, with the Justice League, that was brilliant because yeah. it's like okay, so they're being published by DC Comics. Marla or Merla, uh, Marlena, he, yeah, Marlena, He Man's mom is from the Earth. <gasps> what a yeah. coincidence! It happens to be the DC universe, <laughs> yeah, and the whole thing with like John Constantine know. knew who Skeletor was. I was like, this is great. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you guys. This just in: Lou Scheimer did the voice of Batmite. There you go. That's I hilarious. Think we've something. There you we've go. Something. Yeah. They are the same character. Oh, so I've uh, seen this picture, by the way, of Lou uh, with this background, and somebody had scribbled out um, Fat Albert and Isis out of the picture, being like, wow. we just don't want to talk about it. I was like, ouch. Wow. Hmm. Okay. That's actually a little harsh. Well, because uh, Fat Albert's connected I, to Bill Cosby. I know why. You know, I, I know why. I wouldn't blame Fat Albert for Bill Cosby's. Criminal choices. activities, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cho- choices. Alleged. Alleged. <laughs> choices. Just leave it as that. But it's okay. It's other pictures I've seen Orco completely screwed out. Like we don't need to mention this. I was like, oh, there's no Orco love. Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on this tangent. Here we go. Guys, Here we go. What <laughs> what Grant Morrison did with Batmite? Have you ever heard about that? No. Well, if you were a Batman person. He, what Grant Morrison does is he goes into a, the IP of Batman and he looks at things that other people have discarded and, and he says, or that they discount and say that is not cool, and he tries to make it cool. And he went into Batmite in a pretty interesting way. So, you know, Rob knows that I wasn't a huge fan of Orko. I don't tend to like the, the goofy character that's to be more relatable to the kids. But I think that we might learn something about Orko that's more interesting. Because of all the filmmakers in our little pool of collaborators, I would probably peg you as the voice of Orko, Rand, interesting enough. I think you might pull a Grant Morrison if we were ever to uh, <laughs> go down that route. You try to make Orko cool. I remember... Let me say this. The nicest thing that you have ever said about me is that I could pull a Grant Morrison in any way. There that you go. Is a wizard. There you go. Now I've said it. It's on the record. Man, no can, pressure. Can you do a great Grant Morrison impression for us? <laughs> He has a very distinct voice. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I can, but I can try. <laughs> I can try to do Brent Morrison. I had you a half-hour chat with him at the Biltmore in LA 
before I realized it was Grant Morrison. You did not. I did, and I was sitting there talking. I'm going to forget her last name. Her first name is Barbara. She did all the Dark Crystal mangas. And I was sitting with two other people, and they were all, like, notable comic people and, like, things, stuff that I was into because at the time I had the rights to The Secret World of Og, that Pierre Burton book from Canada, of course, mm. uh, which was based on a series, and I know the pr producer who did the most recent CBC animation, and these guys wanted to kind of collaborate. So I was just sitting there talking to, you know, Grant Morrison, no big deal. <laughs> well, a, bold, they were... a bold guy who talks like this. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys want an interesting kind of uh, fact about yes. science that relates to He-Man? Because this, you'd have to live on Eternia for this in order to see this. Uh, on, uh, I was waiting to share this with you guys. On April 20th, this year, several planets will be in alignment that the moon will turn green for 90 minutes. What wow. the heck? Yep. So there's an April 20th in Eternia. I, I hadn't gone into the Eternian calendar debate, but uh, that's interesting. Yeah. There apparently okay. is an alignment, uh, and it only happens every so often. It just happens to be on a day everyone smokes weed, too. So Yeah, I was going to say, guess who's not going to make a 420 joke? <laughs> no, I was going to make it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Have you guys seen that video of He-Man singing, ay, ay, ay. it's like 10 hours straight on YouTube? It's great. Born on Blonde, <laughs> yes. It's the kind of thing that I won't watch for as many hours as it is put on. Let's YouTube. just say we've got our end credit sequence planned out. <laughs> Wait a minute. The pop culture impact of the YouTube generation between that and CKY and yeah. I think the jokes, the humanity jokes, are good. Those are those. You see that was web comics, aren't those, those pretty good? Those there are, are so deep. many He-Man jokes. Again, I, I refer to the nostalgia critic for a lot of them. Sure. Uh, who's going to be in your documentary that we can uh, expect to see? Anybody from the live-action movie, possibly. Uh, well, we have the director, Gary Goddard, on board. That's awesome. That. I, is, I will watch his movie with and without the commentary, but I love it with the commentary just to, to see the facts and stuff about the movie. And uh, one of the biggest things I loved was the fact that he makes a point that Skeletor was too ridiculous on the cartoon to be put into a live-action movie. So they had to change him, and they made him into a badass for the live-action movie. Yeah, I thought it's it was uh, a great translation. It's something that everybody isolates as sort of a key talking point from the movie and frank langell is a is a pretty great actor right he's oh he was dracula just before that he was dracula on broadway mm -hmm. and for the record because i know you guys are both wondering did rob ever end up buying the frank langella skeletor costume that was on up for auction three weeks no. ago no you did not no i did not oh uh, i was close it went for 2700 oh here's a little really? here, yeah here, wow and you got that hanging right behind you, right? You're going to tilt the camera now for me? It's going to be just hanging there. <laughs> okay, here's no, a little I wish. I was close to getting it. Then my wife kind of – my wife literally walked in as the, as the minutes were counting down. I was like, I'm not doing anything, honey. I can't imagine how guiltily you whirled on your wheelie chair. She's looking at your eBay auction, and you just notice there's a roll-up piece of paper that says divorce on it in her hand or whatever, just waiting to hand it to you if you hit <laughs> bit now. No returns, only divorce. <laughs> The By the way, I think we are going to talk to uh, Dolph Lundgren. That's something that I, it's not guaranteed, but I think we are going to. That is pretty cool. That that is yeah. pretty cool. We um, also have uh, production designer William Stout on board. Cool. We sure do. Do you ever hear that about the uh, the the connections between um, Masters of the Universe, the movie, and uh, Jack Kirby's Fourth World? Whoa. Yeah. Deep connections go. there. Wait a minute. Oh, Rand's breaking out the keyboard. <laughs> the keyboard. Okay. Bang, bang, bang. Also, bang, bang, well, bang, okay. Bang. So while Randall's looking up the keyboard, Rob, this question, this trivia question is for you. Who? Don't put me on the spot. I'll, I'll put, put you on the pressure. spot. I'll put you on the spot. You're being recorded. Yeah. Who did the actress who played Tila, whose name escapes me, did she marry? Yeah. Who did she marry? Without looking it up online, which I can see you on right now, so you can't look it up. <laughs> <laughs> As I cover the camera. I don't know. Kermit the Frog. Scott Bakula. Oh, my God. I'm look <laughs> Look, I got Scott right there. Uh -huh. got Scott Bakula tied Scott up Bacula. in his bedroom. Look. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Assigned to me and everything. Asking me to kickstart a project with him. I kid you not. Okay. What project? Quantum Leap 2? Comic book urban <laughs> legends revealed. How awesome would it be to have Quantum Leap come back? 
Dude, that's a whole other topic. We can, yes. The answer is yes. Oh, boy. Yes. A, significant, a significant number of fans of Masters of the Universe suggest that the film is a reworked fourth world film. That is not the case. It is urban legend. Boom. There you go. Google to the to the rescue. There you go. That's now you got something else to add to your documentary. I'll take a I'll take a executive producer credit add on for we, that. We might make that a, mi- a mini feature at exploring the conspiracy theory of fourth world in the way that room two three seven tried to convince us the moon landing was built into the. <laughs> <laughs> do that in a heartbeat because that means we get to go to the jack kirby museum let's do it okay how long is this thing gonna be how long do you got this interview <laughs> no the, we're talking about a he-man i mean if it was he if, it, if it's he-man transformers or horror movies or star wars this could we, we would fill up my whole show which is only two well, hours see, the, a week. the good thing is you're a kickstarter backer so you're definitely gonna get the extended super fan ultimate definitive definitive edition oh yeah that's right yeah uh, dude, the other guys, masses, we can't promise anything. That's for sure. Let me tell you, when I saw that on Facebook, when when uh, when Daniel posted that, there was no hesitation. I was just like, "What the? Hell? Where, where is my? What? Where am I? Okay, I only have my phone with me." <laughs> I was like scrambling to wallet. get to a computer as fast as possible. Be like, "Kickstart! Kickstart!" I you just know, the no hesitation. You guys Bob are doing an amazing thing, and there was back. no hesitation to back that. Nice. That was your biggest problem with this Kickstarter, wasn't it, Rob? That you aren't allowed to back your own. Yeah, project. that's that's the worst part because we're the creators. We're you know Kickstarter won't let us back it. There was many things I wanted to put into that and I couldn't. But considering that the uh, four actors, uh, three voice actors and live action who have played He Man, um, they're all alive. You have a chance to interview them all, right? They're all still alive. Yeah, Gary Chalk and uh, Cam Clark, of course. Randall knows from his Turtle Power days, and then John Irwin, of course. So, but J- John's a no go. I'll tell you that flat out. I just don't see a way to to get John interested. He is he's made it very clear that he's retired and does not want to do this. So we're going to try, of course. But it yeah, would- see, this is where Randall like you know saves us and covers us, and this is where I come in and say, Randall, with eleven minutes left, there was no way we were going to hit that last stretch goal for Kickstarter. And the, tele- the, the telephones kept ringing, Randall. Yeah, you said that is, Well, they did. That's true. Yeah, and we crossed that last stretch goal. The 11 minutes to go. We did it. There was naysaying. He's not wrong. There was guitar playing. He's not wrong. And we did it. So, if ever there was a project to coax John Irwin out for once, for one project, if there was ever one to do it, it, it will be this one. If, if, if it's at all possible... It, it'll happen and it would happen for us you can do I, it <laughs> I, I make sounds with my throat that indicate um, either I need someone to do the Heimlich <laughs> or that I'm afraid we're not going to get John Irwin but we think that we are going to do that and we are going to be sorely disappointed Gary Chalk has I mean, his career. Oh my God! It's just it's oh, so. Oh, Gary Chalk's been everywhere. I mean, yeah, he's and, great. And the, the, the fact thing... that he's been in two He Man series is even better. Yeah, it's He Man and uh, Man at Arms, and uh, it, I will always remember him as um, the voice of Optimus Primal from uh, Beast Wars. Yeah, which was fantastic, yeah. and uh, I never got to meet him. I did meet his co-star David Kay, who played Mega, uh, Megatron too, um, sure. which was fantastic. <clears throat> Now you guys I can't to... believe you're going to talk about Gary Chalk, but you're not going to mention that Cam Clark was in the original TMNT and has been was was he Solid Snake? Yep. Am I wrong? He's been in a bunch of tail stuff. Uh, he propped up in a video game I'm playing right now called Trials of Cold Steel. He was in Big he Heroes. The, Big Hero Six. Voice. He's the laughing uh, uh, blood elf from World of Warcraft. And he was just in the um, he was just on the new show. Uh, he was the voice of the um, he returned to play the '80s uh, Leonardo again because they just did a trans dimensional yeah. crossover. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the whole voice cast. Came yeah, back and it was actually that. and a lot of fans liked it more than Turtles Forever because they thought Turtles Forever, as well as it was put together, they really it was like the Big Bang Theory of Ninja Turtle stuff. They were really making fun of like the '80s Turtles, you know, and making them to be this ridiculous, annoying group but of the, characters. at the same time, though, it's like that's all we had, right? That's the only kind of throwback references we got. 
Yeah, other know. than the, the comic books, which they did in the gritty, grinding sure. teeth. Like, oh, we're the Ninja Turtles, and we're angry all the time because Frank yeah. Miller hates things. And <laughs> You know, that's all I can think about is, is Randall's documentary, Turtle Power, as I'm watching Daredevil on Netflix, as the hand comes up and, and stick. And, uh, you know, all these things that the turtles drew upon reference, right? So, yeah. You know, the th- you're doing that more than I am because when I'm watching Daredevil on Netflix, one of the main things I'm thinking is I'm thinking, I want to do a documentary on Daredevil. Uh huh. Like over and over again. Sure. Well, he's another character that has a lot of different iterations, right? There's a yeah. lot of different creators that are Frankenstein that persona together. Mm hmm. I still don't it's, like the costume of the, of uh, Charlie Cox. I think I don't the, the Affleck costume was really good. Say what you will about the film, but I thought Ben Affleck's costume was pretty great. Yeah, I don't like Charlie's costume either, but I love Charlie's his. Uh, boy, we're really rambling here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was, I was, uh, Randall. I was going to mention the Turtle Power thing because uh, I, again, that was something else that as soon as it was allowed to be available to buy, I was hunting it down i think i had to buy it on amazon because i no store around me had it which i hate always trying to buy stuff on amazon that's independently made because i know no one ever gets any money in that whole blah 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 but i well, you I, know what i i I, I, I bought it and i love it, it trust me I, i've shared it with like a thousand people and be like you gotta watch this you're a big turtle fan borrow this wait a minute borrow it wait a minute <laughs> you mean rent it buy it i mean i mean i mean bootleg i mean no no i mean burn it no i mean <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that people watch it. I know that it was hard to get for some people uh, for a few different reasons. You know, a lot of companies right now that are releasing any kind of movie, they don't want to get into hard copy. It's not part of their calculus anymore that DVDs don't really feel like something that people buy. But what I always say in my meetings with those people, I say, you don't know collectors. Collectors want stuff. So you don't know fans. That's right. There's a group of people out there. Uh, we are all some of those people. We want things. And even if we have the digital comic, we want the hard copy comic. Even if we have the digital version of whatever, we want the hard copy version because we want to display. Look at Rob's room right now. If you, uh, all you people on the radio can see it in Skype. <laughs> uh I, I wish I had it with me, uh, it, but it's sitting at home, and I didn't. It, it's on an old device that I was using, and I gotta make sure I get it transferred to something new. Um, I have Alan Oppenheimer did an introduction for my show. Oh, cool! He wouldn't do an interview, uh, unfortunately, because he says he's not big into doing interviews. Um, and, but he would. He's more than happy uh, because I bought uh, because I bought an item on his table. I, I was going to do that anyway. Uh, it, you know, twenty bucks for a picture of Skeletor that he signed, which was fantastic. He's like, can't do an interview, but you bought an item from me. I would be more than happy to do any introduction you want me to do in the voice of Skeletor. I was like, that is awesome. So he did the cackle. He did a kind of a Skeletor little insult, and then introduced my show. You nice. stupid buffoon! <laughs> There's a great YouTube link of like the best. Uh, uh, insults, insults yeah. by Skeletor. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, you would never, ever in 2016 get away with this in a children's cartoon. Never. The good old days. The good old days when you could get away with insulting your minions and stuff. Shredder, in, 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 like in the current car- Ninja Turtle cartoon, he doesn't like insult any of his minions. He threatens to kill them in every episode if they you know, fail against the turtles, but he never insults them. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. You can, in current culture, you can kill people, but you can't show cleavage or uh, can't insult them. Can't demoralize anybody. Or, or, yeah. Them, yeah. The biggest thing about cleavage, I always, I, I mean, I, I have like all sorts of guests on this show, you know, from documentaries about uh, cartoons and toys to uh, former adult film stars who are making horror movies now. And, and censorship is just the most ridiculous thing in the world. Boobs are on people. You need them when you're born. They're part of life. Get over this whole, like, oh, my God, boobs. Think of the children. Think of the it's children. So, it's so weird. We I just had. Tell you, I, I just watched the Justice League versus Teen Titans, uh, you know, DC Direct. Uh-huh. There's definitely no censorship on, on boobs with Starfire in that oh, one. I got to tell no. you, even, even my wife said, is this geared towards 13-year-old boys? Because this transformation <laughs> sequence is showing every possible juicy curve. It's there like that. no more booby character in dc history 
than Starfire. Somebody Poor po- girl. Somebody pointed out about the Avengers cartoon series that uh, came out before they redid it as a cartoon series to tie into the movies. Earth's uh, Mightiest Heroes. Yeah. Yes. R- great animation. Great yep. storytelling. Jesus Christ, the Avengers never had a break episode. Was, every episode was they were fighting something or it was a continuation of something. Great written continuity. But I loved how uh, I had a guest on who had worked on that um, who said that, uh, did you notice that every shot they pull out, when they're pulling out from somebody, it's from one female character's butt? <laughs> And I had to go back and watch it. Yes, it was the Wasp. It was Captain Marvel. It was Black Widow. It was someone's ass, a female especially that they were pulling it's like out from. Like over the shoulder beside the hip <laughs> kind of reveal. No, yeah. it was from the hip or the butt reveal. <laughs> Let me just say this: uh, you know I'm a DC guy, Rob, and I haven't watched that. I haven't. It's really great, man. It. It's it, so it is, good. It? Yeah, Christopher it, it, uh, Yoss has done a lot of the new stuff. Who. Uh, Worked on one of the drafts of the most recent He Man scripts as well, so you got to check that out. Man of Action, the entity Man of Action, which will be at the London Comic Con in, in, in September. The whole crew, hmm. uh, they do some fantastic writing, and of course, uh, Jeff Loeb is part of that as well. Do you guys, um, yeah, no big deal, Jeff Loeb. yeah, uh, Jeff Johns, maybe they <laughs> you know, let the Jeffs duke it out. Do you oh, guys, man, don't even get me started on Jeff Johns. Do you guys talk about that in the documentary? The amount of times that He Man the movie has been uh, started and stopped. Um, Adam Green on his pos- podcast, uh, The Movie Crypt, had an interview with one of the writers of the He Man script, and he said the money they have dumped into scripts. Oh, yeah. They would never be able to make a movie. It, they would be bankrupt because of the money they have spent on script writers. Because you got to pay which, these people to write the was script. It? Was it Jim oh, it um, yeah, it was the guy who directed. I, I, I know it. It's the guy who directed the Vatican tapes and Ghost Rider: Spirits of Vengeance. What? Yeah, I, 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 I might be wrong. I mean, I guess I could IMDb He Man. I was thinking would, he was going to say Justin Marks too. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking. And then there was like two people in the middle, and then there was Christopher Yost, and now there's another person that they are working with to help cater towards a director's vision, which they haven't announced yet, of course. And I'm like, so. God. So, so well, will to answer your question, was that something that we're going to go in? It's something that we're going to obviously explore and look at because one of the things that is always interesting to me is how is He-Man still out there when there is nothing out there to really help push it? You know, why do the fans keep love like having this love for it to encourage studios to keep, you know, hiring screenwriters to keep reworking the concept? So I, I think it goes hand in hand throughout the entire thing, um, talking about the the movie that might come up, you know, could tie into the movie that was. Um, so, yeah, I think it's relevant. Big time. And by the way, whenever there's a documentary like the kind that we are making, you want to tie it to something that's happening. You want to find the energy that's that's in play. So the energy that's in play, hopefully, is that yeah. Sony puts together a He-Man movie. And if McG is the director, if Kellen Lutz is the star... If Christopher Yost is the screenwriter, like, you know, there's gossip and chit-chat right now on Twitter and everywhere else, uh, we'd love to talk about that. We'd love to talk about how they got here. And, and how do we get to that? Maybe it's, so Gary Goddard, you made a He-Man film once. You know what you were up against. What do you think would be up against a director nowadays, given the way that licensing works, given the way that the industry has changed in 30 years? You know, give us a nice segue, <laughs> Mr. Goddard. You know, that would be an easy way to jump into that with that right kind of energy. Because not only is, of course, the film industry tra- changed, uh, you know, the, the toy industry has changed, and that's an important component to getting He-Man out there. We're going to have um, at the uh, Super Mega Fest uh, next weekend, um, uh, the time this airs, this won't make a lot of sense, so I might edit this part out. <laughs> but uh, we're going to have Mark Texera. He actually was one of the artists who worked on a ton of the mini comics packaged with the figures that are in the Dark Horse uh, hardcover. Very cool. Very cool. I, I'm quickly running to our Kickstarter list to see if he's part of that. Mark Tashira. No, I don't think. Or no, we have him. Yeah, he's on our list. He's on our list. Tashira's on our list. Cool. There you go. I don't. 
Uh, I think Isaac's reached out to him. Yeah, but I, if you're going to talk about Super Mega Fest, don't fool around. It's all about Burt Reynolds, right? <laughs> yeah, I cannot believe that Burt Reynolds is coming. I don't have, I don't probably have enough money to get his signature because uh, I'm, 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 when I go to these conventions, more and more, I'm, I'm getting tired of paying like forty or fifty dollars for some guy's John Hancock. I just want to go As there and meet the. You should. I just yep, want to go there honest. and meet the writers and artists who worked on comic books that I love. You know what I mean? If somebody's like a twenty-five dollars well, signature for a DVD, you know, they'll take a picture with me. That's fine. But this whole thing. Where celebrities are taking pictures, and, sorry, charging you for an autograph, and they're going to charge you another 40 or 50 bucks for a freaking picture. It's like, screw you. That's ridiculous. You know, once so upon it, a time, it, it wasn't know, that way. You should know, Dr. Chris, that it's not just them, though, right? It's, it's a combination between their agents and the conventions that are probably playing them a flat fee to be there, and then the convention's saying, okay, you know, we're going to charge $15 for autographs, we're going to charge $20 for a picture the, on top of that, your agent gets 5%. And the conventions know, will always say, that's not us, that's the people, that's the celebrities, right. that's not us, you know what I mean? Trust I keep me, hearing it's both the things. conventions as much it is, as it is the agents. Yeah, it's just, but I'll, I'll go there, and I'll meet, you know, I'll meet Mark, and Mark charges, I think he's, I think the last time I met him, it was like a dollar for a comic book. You know, that's fine. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll pick out five comics and have them sign it. The only thing I'm bringing this time is that Masters of the Universe bu- uh, book or whatever. Sure. Uh, yeah. And Mark's been on the show, and he's a really gra- great guy. Uh, and there are other artists and writers who don't charge. Neil, uh, the guy who worked on Batman, um, charges. Neil Adams. He charges a lot. And he gets he tries sure to get other people to charge, and they're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to the fans. Well, Here's something that I would recommend to people, and and you know, take this with any grain of salt. If you don't want to listen to me, blow the eight. But I think if you're going to go to an event like a, a let's say a Comic Con, a WonderCon, whatever, why don't you go find those young writers and artists who are selling their stuff right there? Like, so I was at WonderCon and I went and bumped into the guys who made the humans for Image, you know. Or I went and talked to uh, the artist Mitch Gerardi who does um, The Sheriff of Babylon, right? You find these guys, and they're selling their stuff right there. You can make a connection. You can chat with them. And they're the, you know, the heroes that are going to be doing the big marquee titles down the road. And that's the excitement is to meet them when they're young and they're selling their stuff. And you can put you know, a $20 bill or whatever right in their hands. They give you their work. It's it's the best way to do it. It's great to meet Neil Adams. Uh, it's great to get him to sign something that you have that you know you have a Batman that you want to get his signature on. That's meaningful. I get behind that. But when you can meet these young writers and artists that are just starting out, I think that's pretty exciting. More exciting than Burt Reynolds. No offense. I mean, <laughs> I'm a huge Stroker Ace fan. I mean, of all his movies, Stroker Ace has got to be one of those top tier he's kidding he's dripping sarcasm sad and uh, by the way our our autographs will only be 10 and 12 dollars <laughs> Your, yours is 12 mine's 10 is that how it goes i was gonna say the other way around because you've done the turtle documentary as well so you see the extra two bucks do you guys sign the documentary going out to the kickstarter people yes we do cool awesome yeah um, one thing I noticed because I was trying to find uh, a, a product on Amazon, there was a um, a great guide coming out soon uh, in August, I believe. He made in the Masters of the Universe a complete guide to the classic animated adventures. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's based on uh, J- James Etock is the one who did it, Busta Tunes, and it's based on his earlier release that he did about ten years ago, which was kind of grassroots, very you know do-it-yourself release through He-Man.org or in conjunction with those guys. Uh, and now because the Dark Horse books are going so well with uh, the art of He-Man and the Masters Universe and, of course, the mini-comics, um, it gave you know a reason to use his content, which was already pretty much curated, you know, a nice uh, layer of polish. So you know, we're looking forward to kind of seeing that. I've got mine pre-ordered as already, obviously. Now, James is on our list. Is he, is he PowerCon? Because we can't go across. I hope he's at PowerCon. I know he's on our list. We can Skype. Maybe uh, we can he's out there to shoot and we can interview over Skype. There's there's a lot of different options, but yeah, he's willing to participate, of course. Are you guys Good guy also responsible for a great fanzine called Serial Geek? Are you guys working with the He-Man.org people who have been keeping the uh the torch alive for years, you know, at times when He-Man was like pfft, nothing. I mean, we didn't have anything going on other than maybe a statue once in a while. We're working with lots of people. Uh mm-hmm. He-Man.org, of course, He-Man World, uh, groups, you know, in Germany and Sweden. Uh, that's the great thing about Masters of the Universe. There's there's huge pockets of fans everywhere you look, 
and you know we're big believers in community and that you know we don't really buy into the whole internet competition like my site not theirs uh and our documentary really reflected that and everybody kind of got that gist that we weren't picking sides we all want to tell a story and everybody wants to see that story be told so uh, heman.org is one of the participants of course that uh, has been very nice to work with us and, and help us and give us some you know pushes on our posts on their forum and uh you know they're also behind powercon too which is nice you know it'd be great if they did like instead of a he-man movie uh try and do a he-man tv series like on netflix or something or hulu you know what i mean small well, 10 I mean, episodes it's happening it's it's out there for sure i mean look at the muppets right i'm a huge henson fan as is randall Disney launched two Muppet feature films in order to basically get that TV show back on broadcast television. Now, and the ratings have been so-so. They had a showrunner change midway through the season. But, you know, ABC has a great output deal through Netflix. You look at something like Pee-wee's Big Holiday did amazing on Netflix. It wouldn't be hard to see, you know, the Muppets go straight to Netflix either, especially given the success of the Marvel series that have gone there as what I would say premium A kind of IP. I so, think there's a TV show. I, I don't think there's an IP that has history that doesn't have some development going, and it's just some years coming, you know, to the red at the right time. That would be my guess. And by the way, we have no secret information, but you get a taste when you start to do a few of these. Like, I'm also doing Conan the Barbarian, and you can just feel all the companies lining up. Everybody wants to get. Everybody, the studios, the big companies, they want to get these IP flourishing again. They want something that has recognition and has history because it's so expensive to launch a new IP, right? And it's so risky. So, I mean, Disney bought Star Wars for a reason, not just because Star Wars was an awesome movie or whatever. It's because it has a rich base to it that you can use to build all kinds of stuff. And you need that sense of recognition and history and the strength and the nostalgia. You want the mums and dads to say to their kids, "Oh my God, I remember that," and you want, you know, that the fuse between the old and the new. Are, are you sure? Because I, I thought Disney bought Star Wars because they like money, and Star Wars prints money. Because <laughs> well, that is well, true. That, didn't hurt. that was probably number two on the list. This Tuesday, uh, would, Star Wars will print money from every store selling a copy of the Blu-ray DVD release of The Force Awakens. <laughs> well, what I think is you know, really interesting is the action figure industry was in really depressing decline until Disney bought Star Wars – and then all of a sudden, action figure sales have posted their kind of best you know year to date so far. Oh my God, it's unbelievable! Seventy percent of the sales have been Disney Star Wars figures, <laughs> but the, the industry as a whole has been you know rocketing because I'll, of you know, their merchandise arm. I'll shamefully it, admit I. It, I'll shamefully admit I contributed studios. to that. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say I shamefully admit I contributed to Disney's uh, Star Wars sales. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's true that studios would far sooner make money than movies and they would far sooner make money than action figures or output deals or whatever. But the reality is that the only way to make money is to give the audiences what they want. If you give the audiences something that they want, you make the money. And that's why those IP are so interesting and so valuable. I mean, you can say He-Man, and some people do laugh because they think it's goofy or whatever. But they know He-Man. It's got that relevance to so many people in so many ways. The marketing ways. dollar has been spent. Yeah. Yep. I admit, though, it would be great to see. Um, I mean, again, you talk to people about the only really He-Man kind of story we got going on right now is DC, which is you know doing a really good job with it. Uh, I don't know how the sales are on the comic book uh, to really know if it's going to continue onwards. <clears throat> but uh, it would be great to see, you know, more people, you know, dive into, uh, you know, get more He-Man stuff, whether it be like a movie or, you know, a new cartoon series done as well as the 2003 version. More is always good, but now you're talking, I mean, so we've mentioned Sony, which is the home of escape artists who have the option on He-Man. You have DreamWorks, uh. who has a license to the classic media library, and you have DC, which of course is a subsidiary now of Warner Brothers, right? Yeah. And it's, we're at the deli, we're at the Eternian Deli, and everybody's got their, their number in their hand waiting for someone to cut that first pound of beef, you know, and <laughs> watch it get checked out. Because everybody wants to cash in on that, and with He-Man, something that is so Frankenstein and so cut up, Everybody will launch something out there. It's just like we get Favreau's Jungle Book in a month or so, and then oh, next yeah. year we get Universal's, 
you know, Jungle Book origin story with uh, Christian Bale in it, right? Like, uh, everybody's gonna come to the buffet with a plate. And Maybe we got two. the new, we got two Tarzan movies coming out as well. Yeah, and now yeah. and two. Yeah, I thought there was another Tarzan movie. I, I we had Ron uh, Mars on the show, writer of uh, the John Carter uh, comic books, right now. Mm-hmm. Another Edgar Wright Burroughs uh, creation. And uh, he he had mentioned that yeah we got Tarzan we have another one I I saw the wow. trailer I'm in love with it but yeah there's another Tarzan movie it's you know you know it sounds familiar now that you say it. one is called Tarzan and it's with what's his name from True Blood and I think the other one is Skarsgård. like yeah Skarsgård. Uh and the other one is Eric the Vampire as Tarzan wow and the other one <laughs> is, is something like Lord of the Jungle or something like that which Correct. obviously references Tarzan so it's I, I know what you're saying yeah it sounds familiar it's but there's also a- like three different Robin Hood adaptations in the works that are like, you know, neo-gothic, you know, futuristic Blade Runner versions of Robin Hood too. And there's a Star Wars movie every single year until 2020. And 16 Star Wars films every week. Uh, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, the Marvel movies, yeah. But it, it's funny. And, and, and by the way, I can answer but no your He-Man. question. <laughs> I can tell you how He-Man's doing at DC. It's it's not selling huge. It's selling between ten and twenty thousand, I think, a month, which isn't crazy and isn't awesome. And I don't think anyone's going to be freaking out about it. But you know, what if something happens? You don't want to not have. I mean, you don't want to not have it. You have your iron in the fire now. When the stakes are low, then you're going to be ready for when you know the blaze hits. Yeah. Almost like some smart filmmakers who want to get a documentary started now <laughs> for when the light grayscale on fire. <laughs> the time your documentary you know, comes out, they make a huge announcement. We have a director. We have a star. It's The Rock as He-Man or something, you know. It's almost like The Rock Randall would actually make a great power <laughs> and it was timed quite quite well for the release. Yeah. Well, you directed the other movie too, right? Yeah, exactly. The Ninja yeah, Turtle exactly. movie? You're talking, the other, you're talking about, right? He was, was at, at Comic-Con. Randall was pretty much interviewed as if he was the director of the Michael Bay produced uh, TMNT flick, of course. <laughs> um, oh, my God. A little God. bit of lack of research, but Randall played it up. That, was a, that would be a curse. <laughs> it was. Um, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I was interviewed on a – and by the way, if you're doing remotes at San Diego Comic-Con and you're a local station – Imagine how busy you are with people coming in and out and in and out and in and out all day long. They had this remote going and they had a tent and the whole deal. And the woman who was doing the on air, obviously, she's not a huge geek. She doesn't know our culture and our world. So she was just going with it and said, I'm sitting here with the director of Paramount. And I could hear in her earpiece just the buzz of, no, no. So I just neatly helped her out. I should have said, yep, I'm Jonathan Liebsman Bay. Uh, (laughs) I I, I will. Listen, it makes total sense that people don't know all about our world. Like for us to sit and talk about Batman or or He-Man or Superman or She-Man or whatever character. She-Man, the new new one. (laughs) Oh, my God. I think She-Man means something else entirely, but we're not going to go there. We're not going there. (laughs) We're not making that choice. (laughs) We can shift around like crazy, but when you get out into the wider world and you start to draw the finer points, I mean, a lot of people don't know Leonardo from, you you know, Batmite. It's it's all just it's all just a bunch of different stuff. So you have to recognize that. And it's our job when we're making documentaries and when we're reaching out to the world to say, hey, watch our doc about He-Man, watch our doc about Nintendo or whatever it is. We want to say, here's what's going on and let's talk about the wider story. And it's it's on us to make it relevant to them and to help them out. So I was happy to help out this woman rather than kind of sit there and go, <laughs> you don't even know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> you buffoon! <laughs> yeah. You twirl your mustache like a villain. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. We want to make it so that all this great stuff that we love is accessible to everyone. And however we do that is, is what works. Like... I, it's generally though it's by being nice and reaching out and and helping people know about it like walking out of 
any Marvel movie, you hear a ton of people who don't know anything about which character is which, and they just thought it was awesome, and that's good for us all. So say we wow. all. Beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> but yes, it would be great for our documentary to be timed and repeat the uh, strategic landing of Turtle Power if we can coincide it with some either major announcement by Sony or, or some sort of pending release of another film or... Or something. It only helps us in our documentary. I think maybe I'm being a little uh, egotistical. Would maybe help them. You're not being egotistical. Uh, it is entirely strategy with which Mr. Randall Love lives his life. <laughs> well, yeah. um, I appreciate you guys coming on the show uh, for this. Ex- when are we going to start the interview, by the way? It's coming right up, I think, Rob. Okay. Oh, we've just been fanboying out about every little thing to do with uh, our love of He-Man. So <laughs> we're going to hit record the now. The four corners of the geekdom <laughs> that his furry sheath rests upon. When do we talk about Benedict Cumberbatch? Is that soon? Oh, my I God. Did you see those photos of him? Jesus Christ. And he went to a co- awesome. He went to a comic book store dressed like that. Fans, they said, went nuts. I imagine. <laughs> well, because he just no walked in, he didn't like he didn't like prepare the store. No, he just like waltzed in, and people were like, "I think that's better to cover match." Has he been drinking? He's dressed like Doctor Strange. That I'm was not one warning my local comic book store about my uh, furry loincloth either. That was one tweet I read saying I thought Benedict Cumberbatch had been drinking because he came in the store dressed as the character he's playing in a movie, and we found out no, he just wanted to buy a comic book. <laughs> Great, that's good. Yeah. I think the only other time I saw that happen uh, where, where, where fans were like, oh, my God, I, I don't think that's who I think it is, was George Lucas walked into a comic book store to buy a copy of Star Wars Number 1 by Marvel. Nice. Nice. Because uh, Lucas always has problems getting access to stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Man, I feel, so, I feel sad for him. Yeah. I mean, $4 billion he, dollar Kleenex. He, he must have no, blew through no. $4 billion in no time. <laughs> Let's not forget sad George Lucas. That meme was very powerful. Yeah. Just like sad Ben Affleck, like he's a precursor. Did you see the meme God, of uh? I'm, I'm looking at those pictures of Benedict Cumberbatch. Did you see the meme, by the way, of uh, of um, it's it 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 has Woody Harrelson wiping tears out of his eye with hundred dollar bills from the movie Zombieland because he's in uh, Bill Murray's house. But the meme says, uh, "This is DC's reaction to all the criticism against Batman versus Superman and <laughs> wiping tears yes. out of their eyes with hundred dollars." Yeah. Bills. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's like that's, I guess the Michael Bay, Michael. The same thing can be said about every movie Michael Bay has made with Transformers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, wiping the tears out of his eyes with hundred dollar bills over the reaction to his films. <laughs> that guy is single handedly keeping the pyro union alive. <laughs> he gets a lot of shade thrown at him. That poor guy. And I don't think he cares. He, d- he did, I probably wouldn't care either. Go watch yeah. Revenge of the Fallen's uh, bonus material. He Won't says out loud the F word about how much he does not give a crap. <laughs> the guy shoots a Victoria's Secret commercial every year. What else do you need? Oh, that's right. He does do that. Like in your life? <laughs> yeah, to have a year gig with, you know, that brand would be okay. <laughs> Well, guys, Did they ever take documentary directors, Rob? I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> just asking for a friend. Let's let's kickstart that. Mm. You you should do the next one. You should work on is like the one no one has done, the Transformer documentary, and interview no, Michael no, Bay. Okay, now wait a minute. Do you think a guy? <laughs> Here we go. Listen. We're gonna play the game. <laughs> now, now you're now you're now you. I'm, I'm you now my, you've done it. Now, now you've my done it. my wings are like a shield of steel. If you think that I've been going to these meetings at Paramount about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Volume (laughs) 2, what? And haven't said, like, where is the Paramount uh, Transformers cave? How do I get in there? How do I do this? Chris, I can't tell you how many times. Why aren't they? Why hasn't that been done? What the? I mean. Listen, you, you have to picture how this works. It, I started making Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles documentary, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles documentary in 2008. Since then, if there's an IP I haven't pitched, I can't wait for someone to tell me. Like I would Bat love. Might. <laughs> Bat might. Bat might. I'm telling you, man. I don't know why they don't want me to make this Transformers thing. It, it, it's if you it's do, gotta have something. 
if you if you if you ended up having to do that, I highly recommend my friend uh, Benson Yee, who runs bwtf.com, uh, one of the longest running internet transformer sites out there. That guy is like a monster transformer fan. And he well, is so right. are some really famous people who want me to do it. <laughs> That's the crazy part. But I just in terms of also like if you have to incorporate because Transformers is like you know Ninja Turtles is pretty much kind of regulated to you know uh, uh, United States. Uh, I mean there are other countries that like it too, but let's face no, it, it's, right. it's pretty you're much a United percent. States thing. Transformers is everywhere, especially Japan. This guy could translate all that you know Japanese to American. All the stuff, nice. Yeah, just I, I'm. I can't tell you how much I want to do it. Like I'm serious. Yeah. Well, Rand, you I mean, there's a Ghostbuster you, documentary right? that got you, made. He-Man. Sometimes you just don't ask for a show of hands. Oh. <laughs> just start making it. You know, just start doing it, and then. <laughs> and if you are interested in a Transformers documentary, we've got we've got three minutes still left. Pick up the phone. I'll tell you what. Call if it. you guys don't read the news about how many people Hasbro sues. <laughs> I got a really good fair use attorney. She just cleared a tribute band documentary on Beatles music with Queen music and Michael Jackson stuff. It's that was. We are so taking this off air. (laughs) Okay, here's the thing. This will this will be included on the YouTube version of this, but I will have to edit the crap out of this to to maintain time for. When are we starting? That's what I want to know. I'm excited to talk about it. This is this is the. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is the Game of Thrones <laughs> podcast that we're right. Yes, yes. Jon Snow okay, dies. So the Doctor of uh, Dragons. Red Can't Wedding. Uh, let's talk about the Telltale game. So don't take that choice. Take oh, this Batman choice. Batman Telltale. Who else is excited for that? Me. The Batman Telltale. Batman. Yeah, Batman Telltale game that they announced at uh, the Game Awards last September. That's going to be great. Is Kevin episode. Conroy going to play Batman? You know, you better. Because otherwise I don't give a crap. Did you see the preview for the Killing Joke? <laughs> oh, my release? God. Oh, my God. I literally was just like, oh, 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 like Wait nerdgasm in my brain. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so can I can I just tell you what I have just done over the last couple months? Uh-oh. I finally got all of the new 52, like from zero to 50. Of Batman. Just as they're about to end. Yeah, they just they just announced rebirth, right? I was there, right? <laughs> Sounds about because <laughs> convergence sounds convergence failed. <laughs> yeah, and, and the rebirth sounds like a great idea. I was in the room and I was actually funny enough sitting behind Scott Snyder, and I wanted to grab him and say, "I just got all the, I just, I just caught up," and then he's done. You know, it's because DC Comics wants an issue one thousand of Action Comics and Detective Comics, and they couldn't get that unless they go back to original numbering. I, I I know that's what lots of people think. I know why they went for the rebirth. It's because sales sucked. Old guys like me like <laughs> the new stuff, and new people are always coming in, and they don't know the stuff that we all know. So it's always exciting. I'm all for it. I'm a great fan of starting again. And if you go back and look at Court of Owls, you go back and read that Snyder Capullo stuff. You'll be you'll, you'll agree. And That's good. by the way, go back and look at Max Landis on Superman, American Alien. Go back and look at Jeff Johns rebooting the stuff he rebooted. It's always fun to reboot, so I'm in favor. And this Batman Telltale thing, this is no joke. Oh, it's going to be great, man. Our worlds collide there, Ran. Video games, comics, it's a good intersection. The, uh, Mark Hamill had a great interview on uh, Kevin Smith's uh, podcast, uh, Fat Man on Batman, talking oh, about like how he doesn't want to be the Joker all the time because he's worried people get tired of him and Kevin's reaction is that when you aren't the Joker people are yeah. pissed <laughs> because when, they're you like, when you aren't the Joker it reminds me why I want you to only be the Joker stop hiring Kenny Baker who's been the Joker a few times and, and R2, D2? Yes. No, no, not no. I'm sorry. Uh, I was the, saying, well, like I was, if you had a picture of my face, I'm when sorry. You said that. Hold on, hold on. It's the guy who's the voice of SpongeBob. He's the voice of Sp- I'm the Joker. <laughs> He's the Is voice. John DiMaggio? No, 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 no. It's the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants and Yoda from the Clone Wars cartoons. Tom Kenny. It's Tom, yeah, Tom Kenny. Kenny. Tom Kenny. Tom Kenny plays the Joker in a couple different things, and people hate it. Uh, he was the Joker in the Batman Arkham Origins game. And that's when he officially said, I retire. And it's just like, no, you're not going to retire. You're going to go back in the booth. You're going to play the Joker. Because it's the greatest thing you've ever done until Star Wars Episode Seven comes out. And then you standing there for two seconds staring and not uttering a single line is the second greatest thing you've ever done. 
Without Batman, <laughs> crime has no punchline. <laughs> It Mark Hamill just standing there intensely him. on the mountaintop, breathing, staring, <laughs> line. <laughs> I haven't watched the animated stuff. Like I watched, of course, year one and, and the sort of the very canony old manny kind of Batman animated stuff. But that Joker has so yeah. I know Rob just walked away mad. <laughs> I look. You have to. You have to understand. You have to understand for an old man Batman fan. That, it's tough. You know what I mean? Like you no, have to. You love reboots. It can't be tough. I know. It was. And hard you travel to... a lot. You know who was a great Joker? Time. Michael Emerson from Lost uh, in the Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I agree with that. But I was just gonna say, it, it's hard to watch a Batman animation when it has that Japanesey look for me. That's mm -hmm. what. That's what I struggle with. Sure, I can see that. Yeah. That's my. That's my struggle. But you must love the animated series then that was done by Bruce Tim and Alan Burnett and Paul Dini and all those guys because that's not super anime by any stretch, I would say. I I have not watched it very much. I, I know. Mike <laughs> now he's walking away. Mike he's shutting it off. <laughs> oh, 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 he shut the lights off. Too. Oh, my God. I'm a bit shocked too. Why haven't you watched well, listen, that? I have to. I'm a reader. I'm a reader. That's, That's no excuse. No excuse. <laughs> the doctor has ordered a prescription of Batman the animated series. Jesus Christ! Read. Like the seriously, the best thing that ever happened to Batman was that series. It's on uh, Amazon right now too. Amazon. You know what's Prime. funny? It came out at a time where Bruce Wayne wasn't even Batman anymore. It was Azrael. It was that stupid. It was basically yeah. DC's reaction to Image Comics, and they were like, "Oh, you want." You want an Image Comics Batman? We'll give you an Image Comics Batman, and you're not going to like it. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to like our Spawn take on Batman. Yeah. Listen, you guys, you can't tell me that you think that the the Bruce Tim, Paul Dini, that, that is the best Batman thing that's ever come out. Yes, I Yes, can. Kevin Cannot. Conroy, yes, can. the animation. Animation, the stories, the, the sincerity, the, 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 the adult take on the material, yet still universal language to kids. My, it, is, it is timeless. My, Do you think it's better than the comics? My father watched that with me for one episode. He didn't, I mean, he would never watch a cartoon all the time. He watched the, it was either on Leather Wings or it was the Heart of Ice episode. And I think it was the Heart of Ice episode. And my father, let me tell you something. He <laughs> hated, I yeah, I, I love that dude. He hated comic books. He grew up in the McCarthy era of comic books, where comic books were sinful and bad. And when uh, when Marvel ran, listen, when Marvel when Marvel filed for bankruptcy in 1996, he threw the newspaper in my face, saying to me, "Hey, look, this is your freaking comic books, you know, so on and so forth. They filed for bankruptcy. It's the end of it. Stop it but reading comic time. books." But in, but he watched an episode of the of the Batman animated series with me, and it was shocked about how amazing it was. It's amazing, man. It is so good. Heart of Ice, On Leather Wings, Who Killed Batman, Almost Got Him. If you're so smart, how come you're not rich? What's the episode? I could go on and on. What's the episode where Batgirl uh, dies in the dream sequence? Uh, yeah, it's obviously it's the Killing Joke inspired. One. Oh, and the Batman versus the Batman versus Superman: Dawn of Justice movie pales in comparison to the world's finest three-parter. Have... Justice League episode one, right? There are such oh my god polar opposites where Superman's trying to thank him, and he's like, "Don't you got a you know a key to get or something yeah. like that?" Yeah. Or how about the episode where they do the kind of death of Superman, where he's like transported to another world, but everyone thinks he's dead, and Batman is in front of Superman's grave, like. I got some like, things no. I got to say to you. You you taught me that dark justice doesn't always have to come from the darkness. That you you know that you were yeah, you're like the, my best friend Clark, and I never got to have a chance to say that to you. And, and, and by the way, these episodes, a lot of these episodes were written by the great late um, uh, McDuffie. Uh, I forgot his first name, but he created Static Shock. He created the Mile, uh, all those black characters that DC kind of pushed out. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, Milestone Comics. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I do know who you Dwayne talking. McDuffie. Oh. Dwayne McDuffie. Poor Barry McDuffie died of a heart Dwayne attack on the Dwayne? operating table, and he was the writer of a lot of those episodes. And such a, and he didn't, you know, he, he was such a great writer and such a great uh, storyteller. Uh, you know, he said one time at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a panel or something like that, he saw like, a kid dressed as Static Shock walk by, African-American teenager. And he's like, you know what I'd like to see one day? I'd like to see a white kid dressed up as Static Shock and not really matter. No, you're not wrong. And by the way, 
uh, he was younger than me when he died. It is Dwayne McDuffie. I don't remember his name being Dwayne. Yeah. He died of a heart attack on the operating table. Yeah, it's so gross. Oh, such a tragedy. I, I, my heart is pounding right now thinking about it. <laughs> I just, I, I got to go back and watch all those cartoons. Now. As a Batman reader who also struggles with the movies, like I struggle with Batman movies in general. Sherry, I'm so much a reader. The, the, music, the music person behind the animated series, after they stopped using, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I forgot his name, Danny Elfman's score. Uh, it was a woman, Shirley Jackson, Shirley Jones or something. She's also passed away. But she did all the music for the different animated series. Shirley Walker. Thank you. And they actually put out a uh, vinyl box set of some of the best episodes of music, including Heart of Ice on Leather Wings, The Man Who Killed Batman, uh, so on and so forth, Joker's Favor. But Joker's Favor is great because it introduces Harley Quinn for the first time. Um, and just the, 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 the main character of that episode is not the Joker or Harley Quinn. There you go. Yeah, that is awesome. It is, uh, the, the guy that Joker that owes the favor to the Joker. He's just this overweight, you know, suburban. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you guys are, you, I might be here with some animation nerds. That's who I'm with. Oh, and how about, how about the fact that Superman actually revitalized Superman and made him awesome because Superman's comic sucked in the 90s after he returned from the dead but oh, yeah. the 90s cartoon the superman animated series the mitzel pidlick episode the two-part lobo episode you want to watch one of the best superman stories apocalypse now where he has to fight dark side he gets beaten with an inch of his life he gets chained up and there's this great thing where a bunch of the citizens of metropolis try to kick dark side out and then he, Superman defeats him, but Darkseid kills one of Superman's friends in an animated episode for children. Darkseid kills somebody, like incinerates him. And then the episode brought a tear to my eye because I didn't know who this guy was. But watching it years later as an adult, I finally learned out who Jack Kirby was. The episode ends with, in honor of Jack Kirby, long live the king. You're talking to an old comics man here. You, gotta know <laughs> you have. You're mad that I didn't watch. You need to take a week off from making your documentary. It's not coming out for another year. You have plenty of time. Rob can pick up the slack. You have one week to do nothing but watch Superman the animated series, Batman the animated series, Justice League, and Batman Beyond. Because yeah, the Batman and, and Beyond Justice League Unlimited because they tie together. Bat, yeah, well, yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, Batman Beyond. Okay, how about this? Every Christmas, you need to watch Comfort and Joy, where Clark brings the Martian Manhunter home for the holidays oh, it's so, so great funny. you know yeah, and like he's like he steps through the doorway he's like hello mr and mrs kent i am john jones i am a martian and she's like oh that's okay we're used to aliens here <laughs> and he sings uh some i don't know i, I can't even figure out what the hell the it, name it of the only song. it only parallels the awesome song in the he-man and she-ra christmas episode oh that, that <laughs> uh no <laughs> loving <laughs> I can't. I, listen, I'm out. Listen, let's wind this up by saying this. I've learned a, a lot tonight. I've learned a lot about my shortcomings as a person and as a nerd. And I'm sorry, and I apologize to everyone. I'm a reader, not a watcher, and we've all. I think we've all got a lot to be sorry about. And you've got a lot that you know what's going to come your way as we get into production on Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man, and the Masters of the Universe. Absolutely. Found right out. Thanks a lot for having us, Chris. Good luck editing all this. It's, it's all right. And we're around for any follow ups that you want to do, too. Thank you so much, oh, guys. That was abrupt. Okay, Thanks, cool. man. Thanks. We'll see you. Take Bye. care.